here's a question. Mm -hmm. What are the better types of bags for organic waste that has been collected for large scale composting? Oh, great question. Okay, so as I'm going to say, ever the first thing to do is just you check in with your specific program and find out what they're recommending because it does it varies a lot from place to place but as a so so check that first but as a general rule of thumb um big paper bags are best like uh for if you're having to um if you need to bag your yard waste before it goes into the organic collection, a lot of places take it loose in the green cart. But if you have to bag it, um, the best thing to do would be to put it in the really large paper yard waste bags. Um, and similarly for uh, food waste from the kitchen, if it needs to have a liner, it is best to have it wrapped in paper of some kind, like a paper takeout bag or a paper lunch bag, or even just a sheet of newspaper or flyer or something like that, because paper breaks down very, very well in the compost. Um, and in case anybody is about to ask it, I'll, I'll preempt this. Uh, ink, including colored ink, is generally compost safe these days. It's made out of fairly safe materials. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, it used to be more petroleum based and it tends to be more soy based these days days is how I've heard it yeah, explained yeah. and so well, even uh, right. yeah there used to be in old text composting textbooks they say and don't put the colored papers into your compost but now it's fine you can do that yeah um here's another question I was thinking to get our church to compost but it would have to include all organics and compostable mm. cups so do you have suggestions for like how to how to start something up to make it the oh. most Okay, so yeah, so version. Gotcha. Yeah, so um, again, the the to get mixed food waste and uh, some amount of compostable plastic to break down properly, what you need is a system that's fairly intense in terms of heat, which usually involves it being something fairly large and that's turned often. It is technically possible that you could you could make something like that on site, but it would be a lot of work and I'm not sure it would be very popular with the church itself if if this, this is the type of organic waste that you need to deal with the best case scenario would be if there is a commercial composter available in your municipality that you could simply pay for a pickup and have them deal with it which is a really good way for people to deal with their mixed organic waste um I don't know where you're at but if you are in Saskatoon at the moment, our major option is uh, Loras. They do have Loras Organics Division and they have a commercial compost building which accepts basically ICI waste. Um, oh, in Saskatoon, yeah. So that's the biggest one at the moment. I am hoping also that in the future, especially maybe when the city does their big revamp next year, that potentially that might become available to more people as well. Um, but that's not something we'll really know until that all shakes out in the next couple of years. Um, if you need to do it on site, then I would recommend contact me outside of this presentation and we can have a longer conversation on how to deliberately make a really hot compost. It's totally possible. It just takes extra work. Mm. Good to know. It's not totally off the table. No, like you can do it. And in fact, in warmer climates, it's not as hard. <laughs> Uh, but, um, it's, but we're Saskatchewan, it's, so yeah. yeah. And it's also, it's easier with really big piles and you don't tend to have a 10 meter tall, 10 meter wide pile in your backyard. Right. Probably. Yeah. Um, so our municipal compost depot is able to compost the compostable plastics. You were saying Loris can do it. I believe Flores can. It's an interesting thing that um, the if anybody can compost them, it's the industrial ones, like the big the big ones is what I'm trying to say. Um, but not a lot of them want to. <laughs> a lot of times they'll still have rec restrictions on what they accept uh, because compostable plastics are sort of they're a pain in their butt basically, both because they they can blow around like plastic bags in particular tend to become a, an airborne. Uh, pollutant in their area and um, also because uh, if a little bit of uh, compostable plastic fork ends up being in a little pocket of the compost it isn't quite hot enough and then isn't fully broken down by the end of it which shouldn't happen a lot but it would only have to happen a couple times for there to be little bits of plastic in the finished compost and people hate that and it immediately makes them think that it's trash and nobody wants to use it anymore so 
I yeah. guess when it comes to compostable plastics, I would try to check in with your the specific program and look up uh, pretty much every commercial and municipal large scale compost program will come out with a really detailed list of what they do and don't accept um, or what they do and don't want at the very least. Uh, and then read that over. I know the city of Saskatoon right now doesn't want compostable plastics in their green carts. I do not know what it will look like next year. I don't remember what Loris is accepting. I think they might be taking that stuff, but don't quote me. Yeah. Uh, is there, yeah, um, here's another question. Is there a way to recognize what materials are easily compostable? Like, mm. is there a certification program? I was thinking now that right. this becomes more and more of a, zeit, in our zeitgeist, is there kind of a thing that they're identifying? Like a symbol, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, so. Because when, you, know, when you were something... talking about oh, the um, compostable plastics and how yes. it is kind of just a marketing, marketing strategy for a yes. lot of uh, products. But oh, like but there is, so, there is a specific label, at least, that indicates that something actually is proven to be compostable plastic. Okay. Um, so that at least, you know, some shady back of the woods company can't just write compostable on their regular plastic forks and sell them that way. Um, uh, and let's see, I'm going to just try to bring up an image of it and share my screen. There's one for Canada and there's one for the United States. Uh, and then, and then, of course, if it's um, if it's not plastic, then it's sort of just based on your own knowledge. Uh, but that would be that things that don't degrade at all, well, don't really degrade at all, like metal and glass, uh, things that are stable wouldn't be compostable. And then paper products generally are, although sometimes they're plastic lined. So if it's if it's yeah. newspaper, office paper, cardboard that's not lined with plastic, it's fine to compost. If it is lined with plastic, the interesting thing is you could still try to compost it and you'll probably compost the paper part and then have a little plastic then liner that you have to Ooh. take out. Um, and then all of your food waste and yard waste is compostable as well. But okay, so uh, it's okay if we, there we go. That's okay, so um, <laughs> sorry for the unprofessional nature of this. Uh, totally this fine. symbol up on the corner, that's for the United States, although you'll often see it here as well. And this is certified as compostable. Um, and then the Canadian one has a Canada leaf on it because it does. Of, of course it does. Um, I say a Canada leaf, a maple leaf. Ah, yes. Okay. So and this is the label that you'll sometimes find on Canadian programs. Okay. Products. Yeah. So these two together, one of these two should be on... Uh, your compostable plastic product somewhere, <laughs> hopefully. Although they'll often be, you know, like on the box uh, with the, all the things in them rather than on each individual fork or whatever. Uh, and again, if you can with disposables, I would say try to get paper or, or wooden disposables if you have to use them because then you just know that it's definitely compostable. Yeah. Um, were there any more questions? Oh, I'll stop sharing, sorry. Will eggshells ever disappear in your compost? <laughs> Yes, but it's going to take like 20 years. <laughs> Sorry. Um, it's you almost have to think of them as being like little tiny bits of limestone or like very thin little pieces of rocks because that's almost how they act once they're actually in the soil. Um, very little of an eggshell is actually carbon based. Most of it's calcium and it kind of dissolves really slowly as if it's just a little tiny sheet of limestone. So it's very, very good for the soil in terms of adding uh, calcium over time, especially if you happen to be trying to grow vegetables like tomatoes, they like to have a lot of calcium, um, but you, it's also really visible. <laughs> it kind of looks like um, the vermiculite in a potting mix and it sticks mm -hmm. around for a really long time. Um, so, Hopefully it's not driving you crazy visually because it's pretty persistent. Um, if it really does drive you crazy, my suggestion would be to bury those in a trench compost so at least you don't have to see them. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas I just feel when you go into somebody's garden and you see a lot of eggshells, that's how you know they've been composting for years. That's how you know they know what they're doing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what changes to packaging are likely as plastic is phased out? Do you have a, a sense mm. of like the future? Well, I'm not, you know, all knowing or anything, but I, I know from um, 
uh, things we've heard at the SWC, things we've heard from the overall recycling industry is that while some things uh, such as newsprint are becoming less common because people don't buy as many newspapers or things like that, um, the, one of the biggest uptakes is in just plain unmarked cardboard and it's because of all of the online shopping. So everybody's getting, you know, packages and they all come in cardboard boxes. And so there's just a lot of box board and cardboard going around. Uh, and that's probably also what we'll see more of for a great deal of things um, to be more uh, fiber or paper based, uh, which I mean, good news there. If it's in good shape and it has good fibers, it's recyclable. Uh, and if it's in, whether it's in good shape or poor sh shape, it's compostable. So um, it's much better in those ways. Um, trying to think if there's any other really interesting innovations that I've seen. I've seen a lot of recently. bamboo based. Oh products. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, that would also be uh, compostable. Anything that is based out of bamboo or wood or even natural fibers like linen or wool or silk can be composted as long as it's not basically made out of um, plastic, glass or metal. It's, it's uh, compostable. There might also be more things um, over time in, in metal containers, which, uh, you know, th just things like pop cans and, and things like that. But also there are some companies that are trying to make sort of sleek, sleeker containers out of aluminum and stuff like that. And while it's not compostable at all, it is sort of a nice trend in that when it comes to recycling, metal is really the best thing for it because it's the easiest to uh, it's the easiest to melt down and reuse, and because it doesn't degrade over time. So, I mean, in in that you can melt down metal and use it again and again and again, whereas things like plastic, you can only use them once or twice before the uh, carbon chains are too broken up. So, yeah, and they get really yeah. raggedy and yeah. yeah. Great question, though. Yeah. I'm excited to see. I hope I'm around long enough to see. <laughs> the new innovations and developments in, in how we... Oh, plus, so, oh, I, another cool thing. Some people have been making their product packaging out of mycelium where they like... Oh, I love that. Full of, full of uh, either like mulched up cardboard or sawdust and then they shoot it full of mycelium as in like live fungus and mushrooms yeah. and then they just grow their packaging, which is extremely futuristic oh, I'm gonna have and makes me really happy. That. And then... Fully I'm like a mycology well. nerd, so yeah. that sounds like it's part that's of the definitely, end That's part in the of early the, stages. Uh, People are still just starting to get into that, but I hope that it takes off because um, uh, A, it's really cool, and B, it is 100% fully compostable, so. Yeah. Oh, that's very cool. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just like very excited about that potential. There's so much potential in the world of mushrooms and fungus. Yes, and in general, uh, learning what microbes can do. I'm an enthusiast and in no way an expert, but uh, there is an absolutely amazing so range of potential for, for microbes, like things that we've never thought were. There are types of fungus that eat radioactive waste. It's just wild, yeah. One last question, maybe, before we uh, start wrapping up. Sure. Winter seems to be a big challenge for small-scale composting. Do you have helpful hints for small-scale composting? Yeah, so it's cold like five to six months of the year here, which is, it's a lot. <laughs> and, um, but yeah, so you're right. It's a huge challenge to small scale composting in Saskatchewan. Honestly, it's even a challenge to some of the large scale composting, although they do tend to keep themselves with their, with their mass or simply with being indoors or covered, keep themselves uh, going all winter. Um, so when uh, the microbes and compost get below about three or two degrees Celsius, they start to go to sleep. And of course at zero, they freeze. Uh, they don't die. They hibernate until the spring, but it does mean that there's no decomposition happening outdoors until spring. So uh, how can you set yourself up for success as a home composter? Um, the, a couple of things. One, you want to make sure that your compost system is convenient or at least not a complete pain in the butt to access in the winter. This means things like 
um, put your compost bin somewhere there will have a path cleared through the snow to get to it. Try not to put it like on the far corner of your really big backyard where you have to walk across seven snow drifts uh, to get there because that is so annoying that you might not want to do it in the winter time and might end up throwing out some of those scraps instead. Um, so put it somewhere that you can get to fairly easily in the winter time. And the second thing has to do with volume because things aren't breaking down in the winter, there is a tendency for the amount of compost in there to build up. Compost shrinks while it breaks down. Uh, and so uh, that's part of the reason that compost bins don't fill up so fast in the warm part of the year, but in the winter time they do. And so you can both try to make as much room in your compost bin as possible by taking out your finished compost or mostly finished compost in the fall and putting it wherever you're gonna use it. Or if you don't get a chance to do that, or you do, but it fills up anyway, or if you just want to keep it simple and not put too much effort into it, which I am a big fan of, uh, you can plan to switch to a secondary container in the winter time when your compost bin is getting kind of full. Uh, we usually recommend like a great big storage tote with a lid or a big garbage can with a lid and just put it just outside your back door and just throw your food scraps in there to freeze all winter and then don't take them over to your compost bin until the spring when it's all thawed out. Um, you can also, of course, if you want to, you can do an indoor method, something like vermicomposting or bokashi fermentation, which starts by putting things in a sealed bucket to ferment with a certain kind of start. Bokashi fermentation is really weird. If you want to hear more about it, you can check it out on our website, uh, but you can mostly do it indoors. Um, but mainly we'd say just try to set yourself up for a nice, easy, convenient winter, and then just plan to have most of your breakdown happen in the spring and summer. I'm interested in that Bokashi. We have, um, am I, can I drop things in chat? Am I allowed to? Yeah. Uh, okay, I'm just going to grab a I live link. in a, just personally, on a personal note, I live in a small apartment with no balcony, so. Oh, well, there you always go. Looking so into you're what, somebody you know, so. for whom indoor options would, indoor options or a pickup system was really the only options for you to go. So, and I was very pleased when you said that those uh, countertop composting options are not actually composting. Because I'm like, people keep trying to find aren't. those. And I'm like, those See, don't do what you think they'll do. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there can be reasons that you would want your food waste to be dried and powdered in that way. It makes it storage safe. Yeah. It makes it smaller. It makes it easy to take it somewhere else. But it's not finished compost. and. Um, it can't be in the way they're making it in the length of time that they're doing. Uh, just a second, getting distracted. While you're doing that, um, yes. Carol, do you would you like to uh, come back and tell us what's in store for next?